Okay, good evening everyone. We're going to get started. Good evening, my name is Michelle Pesci, and I'm the chairperson of People Personnel Services here at New Line Park Memorial High School. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our 12th grade parent and financial aid night this evening. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to introduce you to our school counselors, many of whom are with us this evening, who are greeting you in the front and with me here in the auditorium. We have Mr. Shereen Cobb, Ms. Samantha Marino, Dr. Eileen Valdez, Ms. Lauren Pulsifer, Mr. Tom Mitchell, and Ms. Jean Loudon Slaver. Each of our high school counselors provide a wealth of knowledge and experience, and will be working individually with your families throughout the college application process. We have created a Google Classroom for the class of 2023. It's on the screen that you can see here. Uh, this is where we are disseminating information to students on various topics throughout the school year. So we did come into the senior classrooms last week where we shared this information with them. So all students should be on the Google Classroom at this point. If not, they can still join. And this is where we will be posting a ton of information for them all school year. As the presentation begins, I ask that you hold your questions to the end. We are actually live recording this evening. Uh, we're going to be putting this entire presentation with video and audio recording on the website. So if you have any questions, we will uh, leave some time at the end to answer those questions for you. So to get started on the screen, these are some of the topics that we'll cover this evening. So we're going to cover finalizing your list of colleges, the common application, letters of recommendation, standardized test scores, college athletics, the college essay, deadlines, transcripts, and protocols. We also do have a guest speaker here with us this evening, Mr. Pete Lawrence, who will present on the financial aid process. So without further ado, to begin tonight's program, I'm pleased to introduce one of our counselors, Ms. Jean Loudon Slater. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for coming. Um, I know this is an exciting but stressful time. I actually have a freshman and sophomore in college, so I've been in your shoes the last two years. Um, our counseling department is here to help you with anything you need throughout the process. So last year, we started with full period appointments with all of our juniors, where we got them on to Navion, we did a college search with them. We talked about their interests and possible career choices. We're hoping that as they came back for the fall, they have a good idea of where they're applying. Um, we suggest students apply to somewhere between eight to 10 colleges. But this can vary from student to student, um, depending on what their interests are, if they want to go away, if they want to stay home, what programs they're looking at. So this is just a big eight to 10, where some will certainly apply to fewer and some will apply to more. Okay. And in that, we will make sure, and you know, we'll review with them, we want to make sure they have target reach and safety schools. Safety schools are schools that they will, you know, are looking for students who have, um, maybe their grades and GPA are a little bit lower than what your, your children have. So they're pretty guaranteed they're going to get in. And those are the schools they'll probably get the most amount in scholarship or grant money from. Several schools within their range. And then one or two reach schools that they know are super competitive, but they want to you know, apply, see what happens. And if it works out great, if not, you know, they know that you know, they put their best forward and they, they apply and they themselves the opportunity to at least try. In the handouts, we included the SUNY and CUNY admissions profiles. Those list all the different SUNY and CUNY schools and what the average SAT and grade point average or ACT scores that they're looking for for acceptance. These are links, so when, you, when this is posted, you'll be able to pull it up, but that was in the handouts um, that we gave out tonight. If there's, you know, and many of the students, we have met with them for full period appointment for, in the classroom. We came into their English class and we went over a very similar presentation with them. And we've been meeting with them one on one for full period appointments. Some of our students have a pretty good handle on where they're applying, and some are still researching schools. So we've included some additional websites besides Navion that they can still use to research schools and learn more about different programs out there. We encourage that you take some college visits, especially, um, you know, they're going to be spending four years somewhere. It's really important to see the campus, regardless of whether they're commuting or they're going away to school. We really want to be able to visit the campus and get a feel. So encourage our campus tours. And then this is also a link with all, the, all college virtual tours, which all the schools on their individual websites have virtual tours that you can access as 
Well, this is a, a virtual tour website that's pretty good. We will be hosting um, Monday, October 3rd, the district college fair. It's going to be at Swanka High School, starting at 6 p.m. I think as of right now, we have about 120 different college representatives that will be there. It's a good opportunity um, for you to you know, walk around, gather some information. Maybe they'll be able to put a face with the name of the different colleges that your children might be interested in applying to. And then there's was also a handout on some of the other college fairs. The Fall College Expo is coming up. That's a big one that's next week. Um, or the, actually, the sixth, a few days after our own college fair. And there was a SUNY fair last weekend, and there's another one in the city next week. Um, some of the more selective schools definitely look at your demonstrated interest. So it's important that um, if you can visit, that you do try to visit. I mean, it would be difficult to get down to school, say, in Florida or in California or really far from here. But um, some schools definitely look at demonstrated interest in the admissions process. So it is you know, important to try to um, visit campuses or do they do have virtual information sessions. We're hosting a bunch um, in Aviance under the college tab. And we show the kids where it was listed. We have about 30 um, virtual info sessions already scheduled with colleges. And they can, if it's a school they're interested in, they can register right through their Naviance account, and they will get ex excused from class if they want to sit in on one of those info <coughs> sessions. And that will be with an admissions rep that is usually um, the admissions rep who's reading their application from this area. And it will be with a few students, and they'll be able to listen to them talk a little bit about the school, and then they have an opportunity to ask any questions that they have about specific programs. And that's another way that colleges will definitely, um, you know, use that as demonstrated interest as well. As far as application types, um, these are the most common application is the common application. We did for the first time this summer hold a common application boot camp and we had about 150 students come in. Um, it was the, you know, the week before school started, and we helped them create their common application. We um, helped them match their common app with their Naviance account and complete the FERPA. Not all, not all of our seniors made it, so when we meet with them individually, we will help them create their common app if they haven't done so yet. The common app is a uh, universal application. It's accepted by over 900 schools across the country, so it's the application they're going to be using the most. There are some schools that are not on it. Um, for example, like Georgetown uses their own application. So there are a handful of schools that are not on it. Um, but all of the SUNY schools, the state universities, except for FIT, are on the Common App. So we encourage you, if you're applying, if you're applying to any SUNY schools, that they use the Common App. Um, the city university application is for the city schools, like Queens College, uh, Brooklyn College, City College, they have their own application, and if you're applying, some of the CUNYs are on the Common App, but we encourage you if they're going to be using the CUNY, if applying any CUNY schools, to apply on the CUNY application. And with the CUNY schools, there's two different ways of applying. There is the Macaulay Honors Program, and then the regular freshman um, admissions program. The Macaulay Honors Program is a very competitive, like selective program, but it is a full tuition scholarship. So, if you, the um, statistics for that are on the CUNY admissions profile, but if a student applies for Macaulay Honors and doesn't get in, they will automatically be considered for regular admissions. The Macaulay Honors has an earlier deadline. I think this year it's November 16th. It requires um, two letters of recommendation and an essay. But it is, you know, the students, I think, get the Macaulay Honors program, um, you get a Laptop, a $7,500 research um, grant opportunity you can use it for study abroad, and it's full tuition. SUNY application, as I mentioned, really the only school if your summer daughter is applying to FIT, you can use that, but all the other SUNYs I would use the Common App for. And the coalition, there are some schools that take the coalition, most are on the Common App. Um, your children, if they're unsure, if you like in Naviance, it'll say when you plug in schools that you're interested in, it'll show which applications they use. 
and also at the school's website. But most will be on the Khan app. So when we did the Khan app boot camp, this is what we, we created a Khan app with them. We matched their accounts. We did the FERPA, which is giving us the right to release their records. And we most of them waived their rights to see their letters of recommendation, which is what the colleagues want them to do. So they, they know that the letters are truthful and candid. Um, the, the last year's the Common App essay prompts. Some of the English teachers in the spring of junior year started the Common App essay with their classes, and uh, many of the English 101 and AP Lit classes this year are working on the Common App during the fall semester. Um, there's seven, I think, seven different essay prompts. They have to choose one, and that's the main essay on the Common App that gets sent to all the schools that they're applying to. Some of the more selective schools have a different, like additional supplement essays that, that you would have to complete as well. And that's all, like when they create their Common App and they add schools into their Common App, under the school's individual, um, in, under my colleges, if you click on each school, it'll show, you can read through and it'll see, see which schools have supplement essays. Most of the more selective schools have, have one to several short essays that are um, required. Letters of recommendation, um, we went over this, had a request letters of recommendation in the spring, and we did again when we went to the classroom last week. Uh, we encouraged them to ask for letters of recommendation from two of their teachers, and your, your counselor will automatically write a letter. We have to fill out the school report form and attach a letter of recommendation when we submit their supplement doc, supplemental documents. So the students should have asked last spring in person to two and then um, they had to request through Naviance. We also did that during the Common App Bootcamp. We had the students re request through Naviance, and if they haven't done that yet, when we meet with them individually, we're showing them how to do it. We also have a recommendation request form that they can fill out and give to their teachers, just so they have a little bit more information to include in their letters of recommendation. We also encourage them to attach um, a list of their activities or a resume to that, so the teachers have all of the activities they've been involved in from 9th through 12th grade. It's very important that at this time they let the teachers know their deadlines so that their letters can be done in time. A lot of schools have you know, early application deadlines. Some can be as early as October 15th. Most are around November 1st and November 15th. But they should definitely let their teachers know what their deadlines are so everything's ready to go when they're, when they're submitting their applications. And it's always nice, like the teachers are doing this on their own time, to just you know, send them maybe a little uh, thank you note or email after the application process. As far as deadlines, um, I'm just going to briefly review the different deadlines. And not all schools offer all of these deadlines. Some schools have an early actions program and some schools have early decision. Early action, you can apply to as many schools that have early action and you'll apply early, usually the deadline's November 1st or November 15th, and then you'll hear early, usually sometime in December or January, but it's not binding. So if, you get, if they get in, they don't have to commit to that school. Early decision, some schools have where you apply early, but you can only apply to one school early decision, and it's binding. So it would have to be a school that you are 100% sure that that's where you want to attend if you're gonna if you get in. Because if you get into your ED choice, I mean, first of all, your parent, you have your child has to sign it, you have to sign it, and the council has to sign that you understand the ED agreement. And then if they get in, you're, you're supposed to withdraw your other applications and be committed to that school. Um, it does give you a slight advantage in the admissions process. And if you look at the statistics of early applicants, usually they accept more of their class in the early admissions or early decision pool than in the regular pool. So ED does give you a slight advantage because it's a binding agreement, but you also have to make sure that it makes sense for you and your family um, financially before you, you know, commit to doing the ED agreement. Rolling admissions, some schools have where they start accepting applications from, say, September on, and um, you know, they'll, throughout the, the admissions process until their class is full. So my advice is try to apply on the earlier side because you have a better chance if you wait till the very last minute, their class could be full. 
And then regular admissions deadlines are usually around January 1st, January 15th. Some have later deadlines in March. Um, some schools don't have early action. Like they might just have an early decision plan and then a regular decision plan, which is, has a January 1st deadline. So you have to look and see what each school, what their admissions decision plans are. We will be hosting several on-site admissions. We do this every year with the local colleges. Um, we are almost done finalizing our dates. And the, the criteria each year changes slightly for the schools. But we do do it with um, Hofstra, New York Institute of Technology, LIU, Post, Malloy, Adelphi, and St. John's. And these are, um, we will be going into classrooms once we have all the dates and information finalized, and we'll hand it out to all the seniors, and it'll list what each school's admissions criteria is, and they will have to make appointments in the guidance office for their for interviews, the dates that the schools are going to be there. So the admissions rough will come in, well, they'll all be on a different date, and students will have to apply ahead of time, and then they will have an interview with the admissions rep on the date, and um, they wait the application date and give them an admissions decision right on the spot. Some of the schools, like in the past, St. John's has also awarded scholarship money during the um, on-site interviews. They are, you can't do on-sites for all programs though. So like if you're looking to do pharmacy at St. John's, they're not gonna do it on on-site admissions. Um, some of uh, NYIT, the DO program, they don't do on-site admissions for that. And then some of the, um, like nursing at Malloy, um, nursing at Malloy and Delphi might have a slightly higher GPA requirement than for other programs, but that will all be listed on the flyer when we give, it, when we give them out to the students. In the past, Adelphi and Malloy have accepted nursing students at on-site admissions. We're hoping that it will be the same this year, but from year to year, sometimes it's um, We are here to help throughout the process. Um, like I said, we're meeting individually with students right now, but at any point that you want to come in and make an appointment, please don't hesitate to call the guidance office. So Mr. Mitchell will continue. Good evening, everybody. Anyone having in there? Good stuff? All right, gets even more excited. We're talking about standardized tests, uh, ACT and SATs. Um, so many colleges have announced that they will be test optional again this year. So we supplied for you a list of test optional schools. Um, with that being said, some of these models and more so specific programs may still require standardized test uh, scores in that individualized program. So while you've been accepted to the institution, the program can also be contingent upon uh, test scores. Um, SAT and ACT scores uh, can also award merit-based scholarships, which we'll talk about more later as well, for incoming students. So this is also a great way to uh, secure a little bit more uh, financial aid uh, through the process if you decide to submit those scores. Um, the way to register for the SAT or the ACT is the collegeboard.org or the actstudent.org. Uh, um, there you'll be able to request the scores directly as you send them off to the colleges. Um, super score. We get asked a lot too about what is a super score. A uh, super score is a student's best combined score by section, um, regardless of their test date. So, for example, uh, suppose a student takes an SAT exam in December and they score 1,200 uh, with a 600 verbal and a 600 math. Then they decide to take the test again in May. Um, again, they get a 1,200, but they do a 650 verbal, 550 math. So the super score would then be 1250 because they're able to combine the 650 from the verbal um, with the other 600 from the math. So they're able to combine those scores which would give them a super score. The um, ACTs work a little bit differently. Uh, they're similar where they can combine a score, but usually the colleges are automatically combining those scores uh, and they do the best match for each student for the four sections. Okay. So again, the, the website is directly collegeboy.org or ACT uh, student. Still time to take the SATs or the ACTs. So if a student decides, you know what, I might want to try again, get that score up a little bit more, take it a third time, or they might be applying for a more specialized program, they realize a little later on, they listen, I need to submit a score, or again, they're trying to improve those uh, scores. We still have some tests October 1st, 
Um, the late registration deadline for that is September 20th. Uh, we have another one November 5th right here at New Hyde Park. Um, the registration deadline is October 7th. Late registration deadline is October 25th. And then lastly, another one for the SATs on December uh, 3rd. November 3rd is the registration deadline. Late registration deadline is November 22nd. Deadline changes mimic the late registration dates. For the ACTs, October 22nd, the registration, late registration deadline is September 30th. Uh, December 10th, uh, registration deadline of November 4th, and late registration deadline of November 11th. NCAA, uh, for those of us who are looking to play a Greek sport, uh, potential college student athletes must register with the NCAA if they plan on playing Division I or Division II school. It's also wise still for students, even if they're going to go into a junior college or Division III school, it's still encouraged as well as to sign up for a profile so they can receive important updates, uh, athletic updates, um, in preparing for college. Um, the registration fee is $100. You would sign up at the eligibilitycenter.org. This was previously the NCAA Clearinghouse. Um, it's the same thing, same location. When you get there, there's two options on how to sign up. So you'd be able to either create a profile page, um, which is just kind of like taking a look around. Uh, you'll get updates, you get important information. And then there's something called the certification account. So if you were to receive um, a letter of interest, or you were to have uh, moved along more in the process of being recruited, that's an account that you would set up. If you decide just to set up the profile, just to get some of the updates, you can convert that into a certification account without restarting the whole process. So sometimes that's the route that students will go, so they're getting all the updates that are needed, and then if they decide to progress with that, they get that um, letter of intent uh, or commitment letter, then they move on. The SAT and AC ACT scores must be sent again from College Board or the ACT website. Um, and student athletes must meet eligibility um, guidelines in order to play. So there's different uh, guidelines for if you're deciding to play Division I, Division II, uh, or Division III. So please speak to your counselor if you feel that this is an opportunity uh, for your student, and uh, we'll assist them in the map it out for you. Transcripts. So good news, unofficial transcripts are going to be uploaded to the Infinite Campus Backpack on uh, 923 for review. Um, any issues should be reported to us in guidance uh, by 928. Um, when we were doing the presentations in the classroom, we had the opportunity to supply everyone a copy of a transcript. So hopefully they were taking that time last week to go over the transcript, review it carefully for any discrepancies, making sure things like your personal information is correct, the courses that they took are there, uh, anything with grades, if they see any discrepancies, um, to report it back to us. Um, we really haven't seen much come back. We ask you to do the same thing, right? Another set of eyes would be great, or we upload these on Tanaviance and we start sending these out. We want to make sure everything is correct, and that includes even like the personal information that's listed there. Uh, official transcripts, including rank, will be released soon, um, so we'll have that out as well. And the record release forms. So while we're finishing up the college application process, we're working on our Naviance accounts. Um, Mr. Cobb and Ms. Polsko were kind enough to start to send out these blue forms. So everyone should have got this in the packets that they were receiving. Um, most colleges require that official transcripts be sent directly by the high school. Guess what? There are some opportunities from some schools for self-reporting. It's usually coming from, the, from us as the, the council. Uh, counselors must be informed about where they are applying to school. Number one question, do I have to fill out one of these for every school? Yes, the answer is yes. We got tons of these though at the guidance office. I'm sure they'll be all around the living room before you know it. Um, but they're a great resource for us to keep track of where we're sending uh, your students' records. Application deadline, as we were speaking before, very important to identify that on the blue form for us, the record release form. It's located at the top because those uh, deadlines, they change. It could be from 10 15 to 11 1, 11 15. Regular decision could be uh, the first of the year. They're listing for us as well the college of their choice, again, one per college. Uh, if they know the intended major, that's great. Hopefully, they'll put that down for us as well. Then they're selecting uh, the application type. So, usually, they're going to be picking from the two uh, the Common App or the CUNY application. Um, so, they need to highlight that. Or if they're going to apply, 
or Napoleonics or uh, Soviet deals. Then they'll check the box uh, indicating if they're going to be early action, early decision, rolling, or regular decision. And most importantly for us too, they're going to identify under letters of recommendation who are their first two preferences for letters of recommendation. And this is important because there are some institutions that only require one. So Binghamton, for example, has one letter of recommendation that we're sending out. So it would be beneficial if they indicate in order how they prefer those to be sent out. Okay. So a college records release form, all needs, they all need to be filled out at least 10 days prior to uh, the deadline. So they should be submitted and logged into the guidance office with, uh, 10 days prior to the deadline that they're applying for. If they're applying for a regular decision, um, that deadline bumps up a little. They should be doing that by December 9th um, because of the breaks and how that, those timelines fall. We want to make sure that we get all the information out and that we're meeting all the deadlines that uh, are indicated. Okay. So financial aid, we'll have our guest speakers present that in a few minutes. I'll be introducing them. But different types of aid that we'll be talking about, loans, uh, subsidized, unsubsidized loans, grants, scholarships, federal work study program, how to get involved in that. FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid. Uh, the FAFSA opens up on 10-1, October 1st, and it should be completed by the first of the year. Hopefully all this will be completed in the fall, uh, before the holiday, uh, before the break. Um, also the CSS profile, some schools require financial aid. Be sure to check the school's official website to see if this is an option. And what we'll be doing through guidance, as we were speaking about before through our Google Classroom, we will be posting a monthly scholarship bulletin. So we started already in September, but each month we will be posting other outside scholarship opportunities. Um, another great resource on to get a little bit more money in there and to uh, help pay for some of the expenses in college. Um, so with all that being said, before I introduce our uh, guest speakers for financial aid, we just again, to reiterate some of the points we were speaking before, uh, we know this is a stressful time, not only planning for college and careers and so on, our future, but also our senior year. Um, so we have nine counselors in our PPS support team down in guidance, uh, four clinical support staff, which also includes two social workers, uh, two school psychologists. Um, we're always available, we always have an open door policy. Anytime that your son or needs to come down and speak with us, uh, please make sure that you send them our way. Um, our district has also partnered with Rockwell Health to provide other outside resources to any students uh, with emotional support. That's a need for emotional support. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our uh, two financial aid folks. We have Mr. Pete Lawrence and uh, John Cahill from Wealth Management Solutions. I was told I have two hours, so I can sit back, relax, enjoy. Um, I'm going to go through, there's 1,100 pages of federal financial aid regulations. I'm going to cram it through a short period of time. I'm going to share a lot of important dates, forms, applications, and states we've seen. I think this is either my 11th or 12th year here at my park, so it's a pleasure to be back. So I just do, I'm going to ask one thing, just hold your question until the end. I'll be up here in the front, my partner John will be in the back. If you have any questions, I'm going to open up for a general Q&A, raise your hand. And what I've found over the years is that the questions that you ask will help other parents. And then if you have a pressing, burning question, being uh, October 1st is right around the corner when these applications open up. If you want to grab myself or John, feel free to do that at the end. Um, so moving right into it. Let me just give you a little quick little background on myself. I grew up in Massapequa, I graduated in 1990, and the reason why I have such passion for the late stage college planning and the financial aid process is that when I was going through the application process, the selection process, my parents set a limit on where we could go. So a lot of you are thinking of you know, the exorbitant cost of education, and I, I, I made it very easy. I said I want to go to either Penn State, or Loyola. I, I played soccer. I want to go to Loyola. He said, we can't afford it. You can't go there. So what do you mean I can't go there? You, we just can't afford it. So the night before the application deadline, is my mom sat me down and said, fill out the SUNY application. I said, okay, I did it. I said, I'm going, I'm, I'm going away. Let's 
staying home, going away. So I ended up, and I shared this story with zero regret. Ended up going to Binghamton, got to play soccer, got a great education. So I shared that because had my parents known then what I know now, what I share with parents all throughout the year now, this, the choices would have been different. So hopefully when I share some of the misconceptions out there and the mistakes that we've seen over the last 20 plus years of, of guiding parents through this process, um, you know, your situation, your conversations with your son or your daughter will be different. So the cost of education, skyrocketing. Less, less aid from government sources. Teacher salaries are going up. All, how, many, how many of you have in the last, let's say three to six months have visited a college campus? Just quick show of hands. So I'm sure many of you have seen buildings being built, athletic fields being built. Those costs are being passed on to us as parents. I have my, my daughter is currently a senior at Florida Atlantic. My son graduated from Southern University uh, last year. So when I started 20, almost 25 years ago of guiding parents through this process, 15, 17, 16 years later, I said, wow, now I'm doing it. You know, and, you know, my kids said, well, dad, you do this for a living. This has to be easy. I said, well, no, you still have to make choices. I still have to find the value for you in making sure that you get the best education, you, you position yourself properly to get the best scholarships. And I do what I can so that I see value in providing you the education. What I'm going to share with you tonight is really looking at the value and how it's very possible to have these expensive private schools of seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars a year bring their costs down to a number that's affordable, that's doable, that's within your budget, rather than just looking at a school and saying, "Oh, this is eighty thousand dollars a year, I just can't do it." So there's a lot of money out there. So all these costs that are in, and changes that are being done by the schools are being passed on to us. So there are about 25% of the private universities out there today that are now at $80,000 a year, cost of attendance. So when you look at financial aid, and when you go through your cost analysis of looking at a school, when you submit your FAFSA and your CSS profile, these schools are gonna come back, with, back to you and say, Yes, our tuition is a certain number, but they add on top of that fees, books, personal expenses, room and board, transportation. All these costs get factored into your cost of attendance when they calculate which, how much need you have in determining how much need-based grants or scholarships they can offer you. So we get 80,000 on the high end, 82 let's call it, and our value in our SUNY system to go away to a SUNY school, and they've already discounted their tuition for us, being residents. Tuition, let's, let's call it 8,000, eight to 9,000. Room and board is 15,000. Fees could be two to 3,000. So you're somewhere around 25 to $26,000 per year for a SUNY school. That's for one year. Multiply that times four, times the number of children that you have. The numbers are, are pretty staggering. How are we supposed to pay for that? Savings, 529 plan, custodial account, maybe you put money aside. Borrowing, I'm gonna talk in, in a couple of slides about good debt, bad debt, and the types of loans that are available to your son or your daughter and available to you. There, I'm sure that there's questions out there about this loan forgiveness program, maybe it applies to something that they already have children in college. You know, I, I'll talk about that, or I can answer questions about that. Scholarships, the scholarships that I'm gonna to refer to are scholarships that are awarded by the school, by the colleges themselves. There are, there are a lot of private scholarships out there. But when, we, when I look at, when we look at the pie chart of where does the assistance to go to college come from, only 2% of the total funding that's available comes from these private scholarships. I'm not saying don't apply for them. FastWeb, Cap, CapEx, and the guidance department will help you navigate some of those private scholarships you can apply for. But the sweet spot is the money from the schools themselves. This is one of my favorite slides because I hear this all the time. So when having a conversation with, okay, with parents or families, we'll have you apply for a financial aid, you submit your FAFSA. Well, we make too much money. 
So my, res my response to my question then becomes, according to what formula? Which formula, or who told you you made too much money? So there's the federal formula, there's the state formula, and there's the institutional formula. Three different formulas. Not one of them is ever going to say you make too much money. So if you were to ask me, well, Pete, is there an income number where I get nothing? The answer is no, because there's so many other factors that come into play. Number of children in college. If you have multiple children attending college at the same time, your income gets cut in half. If age is a factor, family size is a factor. So there's no magic number where you say, if I make this amount of money, I'm not going to qualify for financial aid. And one of the messages I want to make very clear is, more, is that more and more schools today, regardless of your financial situation, regardless of your income, your assets, where your son or daughter decides to apply to, more and more schools are required, at, at a minimum the fact, so some of the CSS profile, at least in the first year, to even offer merit-based scholarships. I don't love it, I don't, but I don't make the rules. Some schools even require it if your son or daughter gets offered a, let's say, a $20,000 academic-based scholarship, nothing to do with me. As long as they maintain, let's say, a 3.0 GPA, that'll be renewed for four years. Some schools will say, as long as you submit your facts each year. So you want to get in the game, you want to make sure that you know, when you, especially in the first year, what applications those schools require. We own a home, hear that too. Under the federal financial aid formula, so on the FAFSA, and I've reviewed thousands of FAFSA in the last 25 years, one of the biggest mistakes I see parents make is that they list the, the value or the equity in their home on the FAFSA. Your home is not an asset on the FAFSA. So, so come October 1st, and every year thereafter, when you see the question of value of investments in real estate, your home is not real estate for federal financial aid purposes. It is in your net worth, but your home is not the one the fast. Grades, grades have nothing to do with the need-based financial aid system. Grades will determine academic scholarships, what, what school your son or daughter can get into. They have nothing to do with the eligibility for federal aid, state aid, or institutional need-based aid. So what we're looking at now is probably another part of the of $250 billion of aid. I'm not talking about loans, we're talking about work study. Grants and scholarships, that's available for you, for your son or your daughter to get a piece of if you're not to position yourself how to apply. So just real quick, here's the financial aid formula. I mentioned before cost of attendance. Those are all the costs for you to send your son or your daughter to school for one year. Cost of attendance, not just tuition. He or she can qualify for financial aid, grants, scholarships, federal loan, work study, that can be, can be applied towards room and board as well. So cost of attendance. When you go through either submitting the FAFSA or the CSS profile, there's going to be a calculation that's done that calculates your expected family contribution, EFC. Now, I say this now because for those of you that are, that are parents of seniors right now, this formula and the EFC number still applies. Proposed that next year, beginning in 2024, is going to be a new calculation, a new formula. It's going to be called the Student Aid Index. So you go through this process this year, you may qualify for X amount of money. Next year, then that number might change. But we got to go take one year at a time. Because the thing about the financial aid system is that you have to reapply each and every year. Every October 1st, you get another chance to apply, another chance to go back to the school and ask for more money. So just you need to know what these numbers are. So when you submit your FAFSA, and October 1st is the date, but I would just be very careful about October 1st, about October 2nd, October 1st on a Saturday. We field tested over the last 20 plus years, trying to get jam FAFSAs in on October 1st. The site crashes, FAFSAs get lost. So Please, 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 don't just rush and wake up on Saturday morning, October 1st, and I gotta get my FAFSA done. Make sure you have all your documentation, make sure the website is working, make sure you've created your, your FSA IDs. So, and while, while I'm talking out loud, I'll make sure you, that, for those of you that have not created your FSA IDs yet, 
You will need those learners to make it faster. The student and one parent needs to create an FSA entity. So on studentaid.gov, that is now the all-encompassing website for all federal aid, studentaid.gov. You go on there, you'll create your FSA and you're using a password. One for your son or daughter, and one for yourself, or one parent. So, back to the formula. If the cost of the school, cost of attendance, is greater than what you're expected to pay, you have need. Need is then what you're eligible for. If you have demonstrated financial need, your need, that gap between what the school costs and what you're expected to pay, can be made up of federal aid, state aid, institutional aid. Grants are considered gifting. You do not pay them back. There is no requirements that you have to live in the state or take a certain, or have a certain degree, have a certain number of years. You are you're awarded a federal grant or a state grant on a year-by-year -year basis. You keep that money. Go ahead, it's, it's applied toward your, toward your tuition. So there's Pell Grants, the Supplemental Education educational opportunity grants, college work study. Many of your many of your students, your, your children will be awarded college work study. College work study is, is a job on campus that's a, that's need based, determined by the federal government. That basically says come to our university, we will pay you to study. Hopefully they get a job in their field of in their major and it's just like a job. They get a paycheck, which they can even choose to take the paycheck or have it apply towards their tuition. Subsidized and unsubsidized staffing loans. Every single student that submits a FAFSA, regardless of the school they go to, the type of school, from community to Ivy, will be eligible for a direct student loan. Do I get the question? Teach you, we take these loans. If your son or daughter qualifies for a subsidized loan, subsidized means interest-free for as long as they're in school. So my opinion, there's no reason not to take those loans. Unsubsidized simply means that the interest starts to occur. Now as a freshman going into college, the limit or the cap on those loans is $5,500 for the year. Now financial aid is always done by semester. So if you look at your net out of pocket and says you owe $10,000 for the year, you owe $5,000 in August, you owe $5,000 in January. All financial aid is split into by, into by semester. So the Stafford loan, as long as you submit a FAFSA, your student will be eligible for a direct Stafford loan. So the amounts are $5,500 the first year, $6,500, $7,500, $7,500. After four years. Perkins loans. My, my, most of the school, the government's really doing away with the Perkins loans. There's a few schools left that will the Perkins loans. And then the Parent PLUS loan, that's going to be the loan that after you've submitted all your applications, come May 1st of, your, of their senior year, they commit to the school. You've gone back to the school and you've appealed. You've asked, you've asked for more money. You've exhausted all your efforts. Now you've, you know the school, you know all the aid you're getting. Now you have a balance. As a parent, as long as you've submitted a FAFSA, you can apply for a parent plus loan. It is a federal loan. All the terms and conditions are set by the federal government. Rates will change every July 1st, but it is a, is a way to help defray or offset some of the costs out of pocket, not to have to pay out of pocket. All the federal loan, or I say all education loan, whether it be student loans, parent loans or private student loans, do give you the option to defer all your payments until after graduation. So six months after graduation. So you can take out a parent plus loan of $20,000 a year for four years. Interest will accrue. So I always encourage my parents to at least pay the interest. But you will not have to be required to make any payments until six months after graduation, including rent. State government. So on October, let's say 3rd, 4th, and 5th, once all the lectures are out of the system, you go ahead and submit your FAFSA. If your son or daughter was applying to a school in the state of New York, there's going to be a link in the confirmation page of your FAFSA to submit your state aid application. That's called the Tuition Assistance Program. That's TAP. Yep, there are income limits or qualifications to that. 
but I will just give you this as an, over, as an overview. If your adjusted gross income from 2021, because they go two years back, so with all of your parents are seniors, in two weeks when you go to submit your FAFSA, you'll have, you, you'll have your 2021 tax return and your W-2 in front of you. If your adjusted gross income is under 125,000, most certainly what you want to submit your TAP application. Because you'll either qualify for TAP or the Excelsior Scholarship. The Excelsior Scholarship and the Enhanced Tuition Award are fairly new programs in the state of New York that if your AGI is under 125, 125,000, your student will qualify for, on the Excelsior Scholarship, the tuition paid for at a SUNY or a CUNY school. Sooner you're in school, the tuition, the tuition will be covered. Just the tuition, not fees, not room and board. So when you look real quick and they say, well, if you make under $100,000, you can go to school for free. It's not true. It's just the tuition. But this year or next year, it'll probably be close to $7,000 of a scholarship. So FAFSA, you submit, you, you have your confirmation page. There'll be a link in the right, the right hand side. So you submit your state aid application. Submit that. The colleges and universities, that's where the majority of the money is going to come from. So when you submit your FAFSA, and if it says you do not qualify for a Pell Grant, do not get discouraged. That does not mean you do not qualify for financial aid. It just means that you don't qualify for federal grant aid. So continue along the process. Make sure you know from the list of schools exactly what those schools require in order to position yourself to, well, to either, either get federal aid stated or private aid. So how do we apply? So I mentioned the FAFSA. That's those five letters you're going to see as long as you have kids in school. October 1st, the window opens. One thing to keep in mind, as we heard before, if your son or is applying early action or early decision, the deadline to submit your financial aid applications in a lot of cases, goes right along the line of your admissions applications. So if early decision, early action, your deadline for admissions is November 1st, there's a pretty good chance your financial aid deadline is also November 1st. Your FAFSA, your CSS profile, your tax return, your verification worksheets, your W-2s, there's a whole process, and every school is different. I mentioned before, the FSAID, there is again, student.gov. You can go home, if you haven't done it yet, go home tonight and create that. It takes two to three days for it to be verified with Social Security Administration. So you want to make sure that those are active and there's no issues when the time you go to submit your FAFSA. Because in your FAFSA, as a parent, or even as a student, so I mentioned before, you're going to have your 2021 tax return. You're going to have the option in your FAFSA to link your tax return from the IRS data retrieval tool directly into your FAFSA. So in order to do that, as a parent, you'll need your FSA ID. And it'll need to be active and you don't want to get locked out. It's a good delay to submit. CSS profile, there are close to 400 mostly private universities that in addition to the FAFSA require the CSS profile. The CSS profile is submitted through the College Board. So your son or daughter should already have a college board account. In your CSS profile, you can have as many schools listed on there as you want. And basically what the CSS profile does, so all these, let's say 400 schools, went to the college board and said, we, feel, we don't feel we have enough information from the FAFSA, we need more. So what I said before about your home, doesn't go on the FAFSA, you go to your CSS profile, can ask you, what, your cost, what, what you pay for your house, what it's worth, what your mortgage payment is, what your mortgage balance is. It's okay. What the FAFSA doesn't, you don't require it, CSS profile does. That doesn't mean they're going to assess you on how much equity you have in your home. Same thing with your retirement plans. So when you do your FAFSA in a couple weeks, when it says value investments in real estate, do not put your 401k, your IRA, your 403b, your pensions, those do not go on the FAFSA. But the CSS profile is going to ask you how much you contribute and what do you have in all your retirement plans. 
So I know it's confusing, but it's completely two different entities. One's a federal form, one's an institutional form. Many schools, a lot of the Ivy League schools, a lot of the elite Ivy, the Ivy Lights have their own institutional forms as well. So years ago, when the, when the FAFSA opened up January 1st, it wasn't as stressful because you get your admissions applications done in the fall, January 1st comes, you can submit your FAFSA, but now everything runs concurrently. Everything's running on the same time. So October 1st and November 1st, if you're working to construct is scrambling to get your admission comment app done, your FAFSA done, your profile done. Just make sure everything's consistent and you know exactly what the school's required. So we've heard before about different levels of generosity, some schools being more generous than others. So when you go through, so you can, if you haven't done it already, you can have a list of schools, you, you can run what they call a net price calculator. So you can put in all your financial information, it'll tell you what your EMC is, it'll tell you how much grant or scholarship money your son is eligible for. But out of all these you know, thousands and thousands of schools out there, you can lay out 10 schools that all cost $80,000 a year. And your net out of pocket could be different at all 10. And the reason is because different schools have different levels of generosity. Some schools are purely need-based. That your son or daughter could be the number one student in this class, could be the top 10% of the applied class of the school, and they do not get a scholarship. Not because they're picking them, it's because the school is all need-based. It was important to know that before you go and buy the sweatshirt, get the bumper sticker, know that you can afford it, know that if, if if you're planning on a merit-based scholarship and it's a school that's all need-based, make sure you know your financial aid formula and what form they require. Just real quick, this is a family that came into my office a couple years ago. And mom, dad, and the daughter, and they sat down and I said, let me see a list of schools. And it was all SUNY schools. I said, okay, great. The bar has been raised in the SUNY, they're harder to get into, the value is there. So I said, I asked the daughter a quick question. I said, I said, if college were free, college were completely free, were there any other schools that you could consider your dream school? She said, yes. And she, you know, she named a bunch of schools, and dad jumped in and said, well, we can't afford it. I can't afford $60,000 a year. I just can't do it. So I said, well, there's this formula, the financial aid formula. Let me see your tax return. Let me see some other information. I could plug the numbers in, ran their EMC formula. And this is what happened. The dad owned a business. His income was low in the prior year. So I turned my screen around and I said, Dad, I said, Do you know that if, and it wasn't, that wasn't too late. It was right around this time, so September, two years ago, so before they had hurried up line, before the FAFSA was, was due. And I said, These two schools that your daughter was interested in are very generous schools. We have 100% of demonstrated need. Whereas the SUNY schools, they follow a strictly the federal formula or state formula. I mentioned the 125. Well, if you're below that, that's how you qualify for the Excelsior Scholarship. But I said, Dad, I said, would you sort of look total, total family contribution, 10000 I said, Dad, I said, Mom, Dad, would you rather send your daughter to her dream school for 10000 or ever go to the dream school where it's going to cost you a total FC on the right side, 16000 I said, just, just because you, you know, he was looking at the sticker price. And for me, for us, it doesn't matter to me what the school costs. I care what it costs you. So by knowing the generosity of schools and what formulas they use can make a big difference between getting that really expensive school down to a number that's manageable and maybe eliminating some of those middle schools. When I say middle schools, we're seeing a lot now the out-of-state public schools, the Yukons, the Penn States, the Maryland, at you know, fifty to fifty-five thousand dollars a year. And we're non-resident. Those, those schools don't, don't offer us scholarships or grants. Meanwhile, you have, you've got a seventy-five or eighty thousand dollars in school because it's private, and they use institutional formula. They can bring that cost down below the cost of that state public school. So it's just really important to know what formula they use and how generous they are. <coughs> Here's the process: you submit your comment app, you submit your FAFSA, your profile. Everything is done by November 1st, let's say. Then you sit and you wait. That waiting game, especially as a parent of a senior, for the first time going through this, it's painful, it's stressful. And no. So 
But at some point, if you apply early action, let's say in December, you get your you get your acceptance letter. Maybe you get an academic scholarship. A few weeks later, you get financial aid off. And you look at it. And there's a scholarship there. Maybe there's a grant there. There's your Stafford loan of 5500 Maybe there's work study. And you say, is this good? Maybe you don't know. So one of the things that I can share with you, and here's where you're doing this, is that every single one of you in this room has the right and the opportunity to go back to the school and ask for more money. They can't kick, they can't kick your student out. They're not going to take money away unless you apply to the form. They don't do that. All they can say is no. But these schools are running a business. There's like any other business out there. So you can go back to them and appeal because they're, a lot of times they're going to look at your overall, the academics, the financial, to put together a package, and they'll probably under award it. More money they get out of you, the more money in their pocket, they're down. So you can go back to a school and appeal. So I had one of the most excited moms I've ever dealt with in my 20 plus years. Got, a, got an offer letter from the school. So you see on the left hand side of it. So totally, because you, and these schools are great. They, they send this letter, they have all these line items, and it's a big bowl. We're pleased to offer you a total award package of $31,000. It's broke. Call me up. People got 31000 I was like, hold on. Fax me your email and the award letter. So this school meets 100% of need. So you can see the school was 60000 Their EFC was twenty. So they should have only paid $20,000. The school had an unmet need of $9,000, meaning that they, they I'm sorry, they must yeah, pay $20,000. They had a need of forty. The school only offered thirty-one. They were $9,000 short. We went back and we appealed for a letter that got put into the hands of the, the, the uh, director of financial aid. They came back with all this other stuff. The university grant went up, scholar award. Got an extra $9,000 a year times four, $36,000. You are ready to sign on the, on the line and say, I'm, I'm in, let's go. So just real quick again on the access and then I'll wrap up. So on your FAFSA, which every school requires, not at least your home, your primary home. If you have a rental property, investment property, you have to figure out your debt equity, what it's worth, don't overstate it. Don't put what you think you, what you'd like to sell it for. Go on Zillow, do some looks for some comps, get as low as possible. Look, the schools are not going to verify what your home is worth, what your rental property is worth, but if there's a line item on your tax return that shows you that you, that you file a Schedule E and you have rental income, the school's going to see that. Any retirement plan that you have, your IRA, your 401k, your pension, 457, 403b, do not go on the fast. You will need the total value of all your retirement plans for your CSS profile, but not for your fast. Annuities, if you own any life insurance, but not go on them. And if you own a business with less than 100 employees, it's not considered an asset. If you have any accounts, assets, bank accounts, investment accounts, stocks, in your son or daughter's name, with their name on it, and it says, it would say Pete Lawrence as custodian for and trust for Cole Lawrence. If you're a custodian or you're a joint account with your son or daughter, that's considered a student's asset. Students' assets are assessed or penalized at 20%. When it comes time to submit your FAFSA, there's going to be a parent income, parent asset section, student income, student asset section. So anything that you have on the day you file is considered would be listed as a parent asset or student asset. As opposed to if you have that asset that in your name as a parent, parent only, the assessment rate is only 5.6%. Income, two years back. Assets, the day you file your application. No look back, no look forward. So if you run your net price calculator, if you calculate your EFC, and your son or daughter today, September 22nd, has $10,000 in a bank account, in a stock for them, a mutual fund, that $10,000, come October 1st when you file your FAFSA, is going to cost you $2,000 or more financially. So if it makes financial sense, 
you can look at and talk to your advisor, talk to your tax, talk to your CPA, run your net price calculators, you can shift assets from your son or daughter to yourself prior to filing your FAFSA. It's, it's a snapshot of one day. Let's just give you an example of how, I guess I'll say unfair, the federal financial aid system. Family of four makes $110,000 a year. Assets $50,000, so in this case they have $50,000 in a bank account for their, for their son. And they have a piece of property down, a piece of land down the floor. On $110,000, the government, the Department of Education, expected them to pay $21,000 a year. That was their ESC, $21,110. Well, $50,000 of that was in their son or daughter's name, on a 20% assessment. That's $10,000 that we right there. So we were able to catch them prior to spending the FAFSA, we moved that $50,000 to the parents' name, lowered their EFC by, almost, by over $7,000 a year. So there are things, potentially, things you can do each and every year prior to October 1st to make sure that your EFC, or your student aid index, or that, 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 that new formula comes to play, to get that as low as possible. Don't just throw your life onto these forms and say, oh, I got it done, thank God, I hope this, these forms are over and done with, I'll come back next year and do it again. Because every dollar counts and every year makes a difference. I'm gonna wrap this up with a little question. So there's a lot of misleading information out there, unfortunately. And you can hear it from your friend, your neighbor, oh, I, I just spent the fact so I got nothing, all right, you, you know, forget it. You both work, you make too much money. You have a house with no mortgage, forget it, you're not gonna go bother applying. $250 billion out there. FAFSA is a necessary evil. Every school requires it. Most of the public schools, state and uh, private schools also require the CSE profile. So know ahead of time, know going in before you submit your comment app exactly what you're going to need to do to hit those deadlines and what forms are required. First come, first serve. So while I, while I say, while I caution you to run to rush out and do it on October 1st, if you look, if you're, if you look at your, your son and daughter's common app and they're not applying anywhere in early action or early decision, and it says, oh, your deadline is February 1st, don't wait until February 1st. Don't wait until December 1st. If, as long as you have your 2021 taxes done and you create your FSA IDs, get your FAFSA in early. You know how many times I've looked at a, a financial aid report, and it might seem so minimal, a lot of schools, I, I look and I see early FAFSA grant, $1,000. It's just free money. It's just submitted early before their deadline. It's, just, it's found money. So don't wait. And then always appeal. Never accept the first offer. So before we open up for questions, um, there was, that was a lot of information that I did, which is pretty good, 35, 30, 35 minutes. Um, so I want to make sure that if anyone has any questions, I'll be up here in the front, John will be in the back. But for the last 11 or 12 years that we've been here, we've been able to help a lot of new high park families through this process. So what we do offer to you, whether it be in person in our office, over the phone, virtually, is a free consultation. 